Hello everyone and when, welcome to um, today's Ask the Author event brought to you by uh, YESI, the York Environmental Sustainability Institute based at the University of York. Um, our aims are to facilitate and deliver world-class interdisciplinary research on environmental sustainability. The Ask the Author event series aims to provide the general public with the opportunity to ask researchers about their work. Um, today, we'd like to welcome Melissa Minter from the Department of Biology and the Centre for Anthropocene Biodiversity, who will be talking to us about her paper on the threats to the genetic diversity of the mountain ringlet butterfly. Um, hello, Melissa, and welcome to today's event. Thank you very much. Well, before you start, can I just remind everyone that there's a Q&A box at the bottom. So if you have any questions that you'd like to ask during the uh, at the end of the um, presentation, you can type them in there and the session will be being recorded. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, and thank you very much for coming to see my talk today. Um, this is based on a paper which was published um, in October in ecology and evolution. Um, and this is based on my PhD project, which is at the University of York with Natural England and Nature Scott. So there are there have been a lot of documented uh, impacts of climate change on species, including changes in their distribution. And the mountain ringlet, which is uh, photographed here, is a montane butterfly which occurs over um, the mountain regions of Europe and the UK as well. And in the UK, it's our only montane butterfly which occurs in the Lake District and the Scottish Highlands um, and occurs in some of the most uh, beautiful places in the UK um, and it's quite a treat to see. Um, however, um, over the recent decades there has been uh, documented range retractions in this species in the UK and what this means um, is that the populations at the low elevation or the warm areas um, have been becoming extinct and their range is retracting uphill. And I think it was found that their range has retracted about 100 metres um, on average in the UK. And so we were very interested in looking at the genetic diversity of this species. Um, this is because genetic diversity is incredibly important for uh, future resilience and adaptability. And so we were wanted to find out how past climatic changes have influenced the genetic diversity that we see today and whether this is at risk under future climate change. So we had three main elements of this. We had the present, which is we asked, is there any unique genetic diversity in the UK, not present in Europe? We wanted to look into the past and to understand how past climatic changes have influenced the genetic structure that we see today. And finally, we wanted to look into the future under projected future climate change to see whether any of this genetic diversity is at risk under future climate change. And so we had two main methods uh, that I'll briefly talk about uh, to do this. The first is species distribution modeling. And this is a statistical model uh, using climate uh, data to predict areas of climate suitability for a species. And once you create your model, you can then project it using different climate data to, pre to be able to predict climate suitability over time. We also did some DNA sequencing. So we sequenced um, the mitochondrial gene, CO1, um, just a small region. And we sequenced this for uh, 215 individuals across 13 mountain regions um, across its range. From uh, these DNA sequences, we extracted the haplotypes. And what a haplotype is, is a unique combination of the nucleotides or the letters within the region that we sequenced. So if a letter uh, changes, then that means that this is a new haplotype. 
And this gives us information about genetic diversity of a species. So to start off with what we see presently, uh, we uh, found 31 haplotypes across the European range of the mountain ringlet. And 27 of these haplotypes were unique to um, a specific region. As you can see, each haplotype is a different color and they are um, separated into different areas. So this is um, the frequency of haplotypes throughout Europe um, in the different uh, mountain regions. And in the corner, we can see a haplotype network. And this basically shows how the haplotypes are related to each other. And if you see a little dash, that means that there's one nucleotide different or one letter different between these two haplotypes. So, like I said, there is a lot of uh, unique haplotypes across the range, but there are also some shared haplotypes showing evidence of some gene flow, which I will point out to you. So we have this brown haplotype here, which is found in the Iberian Peninsula and also the Massif Central. We also see this green haplotype, which is found across the Alps and the Balkans too. And finally, we see this blue haplotype here, which is found in the Western Alps, the Vosges Mountains in France, Scotland and England as well. So we can see some evidence of connectivity between these populations, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. I'd also like to point out to you um, England. So as well as this, this uh, shared haplotype here, which I've already just pointed out, there are also six haplotypes which are completely unique only to England. And we did not find evidence of these haplotypes um, anywhere else across Europe, including Scotland. And so uh, England, along with the Western Alps, had some of the highest uh, genetic diversity across Europe. So now we're gonna look into the past. Um, so we projected our model using uh, past climate data from the last glacial maximum. And the last glacial maximum is a time in the last glacial where the Eurasian ice sheet reached its furthest extent. And this was about 21,000 years ago. And we uh, projected our model uh, from the LGM every thousand years into the present day. And these are some of the outputs of this with the darker shading showing the higher probability of climate suitability. So what we did is we combined all of these outputs into a single measure of climate suitability over time since the LGM, which you can see here. Again, the darker shading represents higher climate suitability over time, and the highest 30% of these are highlighted as white dots. And as you can see, the areas which have been most suitable over time are also the similar areas to where they are found now in mainland Europe. So this suggests that perhaps um, in these populations, these areas did remain suitable in the last glacial, but perhaps the butterflies were um, situated towards the foothills of the current range, moving uphill as the climate warmed. So I just want to explain a little bit um, what the genetics and the species distribution modeling tell us. So we can see a lot of unique haplotypes across the range, uh, which show that these populations have diverged and been isolated. Um, and we also see high climatic suitability over time. So this suggests the um, populations in mainland Europe could have survived in distinct um, populations of long-term survival, um, surviving it, the last glacial, but perhaps more. But because we can see um, some shared haplotypes suggesting gene flow, and also some areas which have not been climatically suitable over time, for example, the UK, because we know we were under an ice sheet during the last glacial. And so we can um, see some post-glacial colonizations here, so, for example, the Massif Central uh, colonized from the Iberian Peninsula because we can see a shared haplotype there. Also, we can see that the Vosges um, population, as well as Scotland, colonized from the Western Alps because we can see a shared haplotype 
um, in, with the Western Alps, but also the Apennines as well. However, with England, it's a slightly different story because we can see that there is a shared haplotype there with the Western Alps, but also we see six unique haplotypes which have diverged away from that shared haplotype up to three mutations. And so it's unlikely that these um, evolved since the last glacial um, and that they probably evolved beforehand. So what we think happened here is that a subset um, came from the Western Alps before the last glacial at some point and existed as a separate population which diverged into those unique haplotypes that we currently see. And this is called a cryptic uh, glacial refugia, which is an area um, of population persistence somewhere north, um, which no longer exists. And we think that England could have been um, colonized from this area of cryptic refugia. But where this could have been is completely unknown and we can only speculate. However, I will show you um, some evidence of other cold adapted species. So this is a map showing beetle fossil remains during the time of the last glacial. Um, and each dot is a different color which represents a different age that it was found at. And then also uh, the ice sheet um, extent for that particular time period as well. And all of these fossil remains are of species which are currently now distributed at northern or montane um, distribution in the UK. And so this provides evidence that there were cold adapted species which are currently um, in the UK in northern or um, up, upland, which survived south of the ice sheet during the last glacial. So this does provide evidence that cold adapted species may have uh, been um, distributed more north than we thought. And this has been found with some of the warm adapted species as well, surviving um, in uh, cryptic refugia in the south of uh, England, uh, Ireland, and also some evidence in Norway as well. So now we're going to look into the future um, under two different uh, climate change scenarios. So we have the low scenario, which is about a one degree change, and we have the high scenario, which is a two to three degree change. And we can see areas which remain climate suitable, which lose suitability or which gain suitability. And as you can see, there is a lot of loss across the European range for the mountain ringlet with areas in Scotland, Scandinavia and the Alps remaining suitable. You may have noticed that the mountain ringlet doesn't actually occur in Scandinavia. Um, however, our models suggest that this is actually somewhere which is climate suit suitable. And there are other Arabia species which have a similar distribution to the mountain ringlet, but also occur up in Scandinavia. So it might be that the mountain ringlet just didn't colonize um, this area for um, some reason. Um, what I will point out as well is under the high scenario, we can see um, loss of suitability in the English populations, but we do also see some areas of gain um, in Scotland and also uh, remaining climate suitable in Scotland too. So what does this mean for the genetic diversity? Well, if we assume that one uh, mountain region is lost um, due to the loss of climate suitability, then we can assume that the unique haplotypes that occur in that region are also lost. And so what this uh, translates into is under the low scenario, we can see one unique haplotype lost and under the high scenario, 12 unique haplotypes lost, which is quite a large proportion of the total genetic diversity for this species. And so I just wanted to summarize all of that information. Uh, so presently we see high proportion of unique genetic diversity uh, across the range of the mountain ringlet uh, with the highest uh, diversity in England and the Western Alps. In the past, we can see uh, through genetic differentiation and suitability over time that populations in Europe may have persisted as areas of long-term survival, 
in the foothills of their current range, moving uphill as the climate warmed. We can also see a cryptic glacial refugial origin of English populations and a dual colonization of the UK. And perhaps that the English and Scottish populations have not interacted for thousands of years. And lastly, we looked into the future and we can see that particularly under the high scenario, that genetic diversity is at risk under projected climate change. And so at the end of our paper, um, we wanted to discuss what conservation options could, could there be for a species such as this, um, which is a cold adapted montane species, which is under threat of climate change um, and has limited areas to go. And so one of the things we discussed was a translocation. And a translocation basically means moving um, a population to an area which is climately suitable or will be climatically suitable in the future uh, where they have not been before. So it's different to a reintroduction um, because it's moving a population to somewhere where they've never actually been that we know of. <clears throat> And uh, this kind of discussion in the paper was um, highlighted um, in the title of the Guardian um, article, which uh, covered this paper. Um, and so we, we basically discussed what different options there are, but do not uh, recommend um, anything in particular. We just discuss what could be there. And so these include uh, local translocations. So for example, moving butterflies um, up to higher elevations in the mountain regions that they already occur, if there is suitable um, habitat left um, at higher elevations. Um, but then there's also um, larger scale translocations, for example, um, moving populations into Scandinavia where um, they have never been, uh, which is climatically suitable, but we don't know whether the habitat is suitable, for example. And there's also the options of um, moving um, warm, more warm adapted butterflies into more cold adapted area populations to try and increase adaptability. So these are the different options that um, have been spoken about in the scientific literature. But before any decisions are made or discussed, there needs to be a lot more work done. For example, monitoring populations to see if um, populations are uh, declining because of uh, climatic warming, um, understanding more about the genetics, any local adapt, uh, ad adaptation uh, to temperature, for example. And so there needs to be a lot more work before um, any decisions can be made. So um, obviously this is my uh, PhD work, so um, there is still other things that I'll be doing uh, about the mountain ringlet. Um, including uh, detailed genetic sequencing of UK populations, um, which is going to be DDRAD sequencing, which is quite a large proportion of the genome. And this will give us uh, much more detailed information about um, any levels of inbreeding, how connected populations are within, um, within England and within Scotland, and also any signs of any genetic local adaptation, which will give us information um, about how these species may respond uh, to future climate change. Uh, so I just wanted to say thank you very much um, to all of my supervisors and my co-authors. Um, and then if you want to uh, read the paper, this is, this is the title and it's in Ecology and Evolution. Um, and I also wanted to thank you, uh, my field assistants for helping me with the UK uh, side of data collection. And with that, I'll just show you a few of my uh, snaps from uh, fieldwork, uh, going to some of the most wonderful places uh, in the UK um, to see the mountain ringlet. And uh, that's it from me, and I'll be very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Melissa. That was really interesting. Um, and a little bit... Uh... Food for thought, I think, for, for, for the future. Um, if anyone has a question that they would like to ask, if they can type it in the Q&A box, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen, um, I, I'll then uh, ask Melissa the question and then come back to you and you can um, ask any follow-up um, that you might have. 
um, while people are maybe thinking about what they would like to to ask, uh, I did just have one question. Um, you mentioned that you that species uh, groups could maybe be translocated. Have uh, there been any successful translocations done for this species already, um, or for other species? species were, that have been successful? Yeah, so I've got um, two examples. Um, the first is actually on with the mountain ringlet. Um, so in the 1930s, uh, they introduced um, females into a region um, in the Czech Republic. And this was a, a mountain area which was um, suitable and had suitable habitat, um, but was currently vacant um, from this species. And so what they did is they, over a couple of years, they introduced uh, females into this area um, and now is a, um, a large healthy population which still occurs now. So it's been over a hundred years um, and they um, still occur. So that's an example for the mountain ringlet. Um, in terms of another species, um, the there was a translocation done with the uh, marbled white, uh, which there is a paper of, um, I can't think off the top of my head which journal it's in, um, but basically they moved, uh, so the marbled white has been um, expanding its range. And so they uh, moved some populations into a site in uh, County Durham, which was shown to be climatically suitable um, for this butterfly, but it had not, quite reached uh, that that site yet um, and it this was done um, I think uh, 10 or 20 years I can't remember off the top of my head but um this this is this was successful and they now occur there they're part of the the site that they're you know they're very proud of of the marbled white population and I actually went um in the summer because it's not far from where I live um to go see this population it's absolutely a huge population of marbled white. So yeah, there's kind of two examples there of um, what well, one with this species, but also another butterfly um, where it was successful. Super, thank you. Um, I've had a question from, um, I haven't got a name against it, um, saying thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, and they were wondering um, what your thoughts were on translocations in terms of them being a, a long-term solution. Would there have to be uh, progressive translocations into the future as climate continues to warm? Yeah, I mean, I don't really think I'm the person to answer that question um, because we, at the, the end of the paper, we were just more discussing what options there were without kind of giving an option of what we think um, should happen. Um, but the thing with cold adapted species is that um, they are the species that are most vulnerable from climate change, um, obviously, because they're used to these cold environments. And especially if they are montane, that they are going to run out of habitat at some point. And so it is quite a controversial topic. Um, but for species such as that, we may have kind of limited options if um, climate change is set to um, to go to the two to three degree increase um, that I showed in one of the maps. So yeah, um, without giving my kind of personal opinion about it, I think it's just something that probably needs to be discussed a little bit more, especially for cold adaptive species, um, such as the mountain ringlet. So I hope that um, answered your question. He, he's also asked, um... Would you expect similar results from a study on Scotch Argus? I don't know if that means anything to you. Yeah, well, funnily enough, my PhD was going to be <laughs> on uh, or, on the northern butterflies. Um, so it was, the originally it was going to be the mountain ringlet, the Scotch Argus large heap. Yeah. Um, but because of um, many different reasons, I, I ended up just focusing on one um, one species um and so yeah i'm not sure whether uh, this this might happen uh but probably i mean for example the scotch argus populations in in england are very isolated um and 
they're probably less likely to be able to um, survive, whereas the, the it's more widespread in Scotland. Um, but yeah, so I haven't actually done any modelling or anything for that species, but it's quite likely that it would follow a, a similar pattern. But, you know, I'm not certain on that. Super, thank you. Um, I've just noticed that there are some questions in the chat as well, so I'll come to those in a second. Um, uh, PW's asked, uh, what height do the mountain ringlet live in the English range in the Lake District? So um, the lowest they occur is about uh, 200 uh, to 300 metres, which is at um, Ertenfell in the Lake District. So that's that's their lowest their lowest site, uh, their warmest site. Um, and then they go up to about seven to 800 meters in England. Um, in Scotland, they're obvious, they, are, um, they go up a bit higher. So I think the lowest in Scotland, I think is about 300-ish, um, um, but they go up a lot higher to about 900 meters, I think is one of the highest sites you can find mountain ringlet in, um, in Scotland. Uh, so it's it's a it's a massive range um, of temperatures that the the butterfly experiences. So, um, which you know that was part of my project is to kind of go to a lot of these different sites of different temperatures and different elevations, so we can get an idea of um, whether there's any kind of local adaptation there, which will be kind of future work of this PhD. Lovely, thank you. Um, did, did 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 you have anything else you needed to ask, Pete? No, I don't think so. Oh, oh sorry. It's Peter W here. Hello. Uh, did you say Erton fell for the two to three hundred meters? Yes, about that. Yeah. What sort of a climb is it? Um, it, out of uh, out of all the ones I went to, so I've, I've been I went to about nineteen different populations over the two field seasons, and Erton Fell is uh, the quickest climb. Um, there's like a little car park um, just by the road, and it's really not much of a climb at all. And then you kind of go up through um, a little bit of forest uh, to a gate, and then once you get out to the gate, um, you can see. Uh, you know, the mat grass start to uh, appear, which is the food plant of the round ringlet. Um, yeah, and they're kind of all over. So it's not it's not too much of a climb, that one. It's just me age. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I've just seen that Chris Thomas has put the uh, marbled white paper in the chat. So there's a link there if anyone wants to follow that and have a look at that. Um, there's a question from Ian Watts um, asking, to what extent does the climate modelling take into account rainfall? Uh, the English population seems skewed towards the western high ground, even though I understand there is suitable habitat further east in the Pennines. Yes, so um, we we thought about um, when we kind of, uh, put, you know, I, I obviously didn't too, didn't talk too much about the methods um, just due to time in the talk. Um, so when we created the model, we wanted to think about what um, climatic variables would be most important um, for a kind of montane butterfly. And so, uh, yes, we picked um, temperature and rainfall. Um, and in particular, we, we picked these variables at the, um, in the winter and summer, um, just because probably cold and montane species are going to be more restricted um, at the kind of extreme um, <clears throat> uh, extreme temperatures in the year. Um, so yes, that's what we used to create the model. Yeah. Do you have any follow up, Ian? Um, no, just just to me, it's quite marked as to why the. Um, mountain ring, I, I presume, has never been found in the sort of higher ground in the Pennines. And I understand that the host plant can be found there. And, I do, and equally, but slightly odd, I presume it's never been found in Snowdonia either, which is obviously has the elevation. Um, and the rainfall, clearly, perhaps too much rainfall there. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm just curious, um, just to, the focus, certainly in the, the talk, which, you know, for reasons you're saying about brevity, is on temperature, is 
to you, it, in your mind, is rainfall a very important component of that climate, um, the model as such? And, yeah. And you yeah. Know, when we look at the sort of change in climate, it's not just about the warming, is it? It's about the drying and so on. Um, in these areas which... yes definitely definitely yes yeah. so we, we 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 included both those in the in the model and interestingly um you mentioned about snowdonia and um in some of our um so i didn't actually show um the kind of the probability map uh, for the current distribution um but you know some of our models say that actually some areas in scandinavia are suitable um so yeah um and and the north pennines as well um, so yeah, it's quite strange why um, not all of these areas are kind of um, inhabited by the mountain ringlet. Um, and there's another interesting thing is that there's actually, um, I can't remember which museum in Ireland, but there's a, there's a museum that actually holds a few specimens of the mountain ringlet, uh, which apparently, according to the label, were found in Ireland. But I mean, there's only a couple, so it's not... Um, is not uh, certain and you know can never be found out if they they were actually found there but yeah it's yeah. there's something interesting um why they don't occur in these other places okay can i i'm presuming until i'm muted can i um just ask a sort of follow-up which is not quite the same in that and um, just the display showed of the um sort of the migration you could uh, there's one way i put in there or the has they moved in the past now, maybe I've misunderstood it, but the um, population that ended up in Scotland appears to go in, in one sort of flow. Um, there was a large arrow for that. And the English one, you then explained, it's, it's um, less understood as to how it got there. Is it not possible that the English one came down from the Scottish population in some way, or is the assumption that it did, they, they arrived separately? Um, yeah, so- they came? Yeah, so there's there's obviously um, different things that could have um, also happened. So, for example, like you say, coming down from Scotland. Um, but the only thing is that this would suggest um, that uh, these haplotypes, these unique ones that we see in England, would have diverged um, after this time because we don't see these unique haplotypes anywhere else. And um, because some of them are quite diverged up to the, like three um, mutations. It's unlikely that this happened since the last glacial. Um, so because of that kind of absence of the unique habitats that we see in England, it's probably more likely that they didn't interact. But obviously this um, is not certain. It might be that due to sampling, we just didn't pick up on some of these unique haplotypes. Um, from England and other places, but we did actually sequence some extra ones just to kind of see if we could pick up any of these just to um, make sure some of our conclusions were a bit more um, robust. Um, so yeah, yeah, that answers your question. It does, thank you. Very, very quick, very last question on the haplotypes. Mm -hmm. the, the sort of uniquely diverse English was our sort of high higher ground is so kind of it's like arms in effect in in that area there isn't a gen the uh, ground in the district potentially at the, the peaks at the high fells and there to get between those you've got to go down into the ground whereas in other higher ground areas there is more higher ground in between if that makes sense is is that why it's so diverse in england because they've become so sort of islanded in a sense up in the at the top of the fells yeah, it's, it's unclear um, at this moment in time with using that data. Um, but from, from just what I kind of observed in field work, it, it, it appeared that the English ones were seemed to be a bit more isolated. So like, um, you know, I would uh, start climbing <laughs> into this area where I, I thought, you know, I knew that they had been recorded before. And they, they'd end up being in kind of a very isolated little slot or just, you know, in a little plateau just up, mm. um, you know, they were, they were very kind of um, isolated, whereas in Scotland, they seem to be a lot more um, widespread. But this, um, this new genetic data, which I have acquired very recently, will give me much more information about, um, yeah, whether these populations are connected or not. So that's something I'll look at. Um, in the yeah, future. It's fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there is a question which I think you've 
really touched on already about are there any current theories on why it didn't uh, colonize Scandinavia um, and I think you have touched on that already. Yes that, that is something that really interests me because I I look you know there's a lot of um, different Arabia species uh, across uh, Europe obviously we have two of them the Scotch Argus and the mountain ringlet um, but there are loads of others um, across the kind of mountain regions in Europe, uh, especially in the Alps, there's absolutely loads of different species. Um, and when you look at the distributions of them, it's, it's quite interesting because there are some, um, you know, which kind of have similar distributions to the mountain ringlet that didn't go to the UK or have similar distributions, but ended up in Scandinavia. So um, yeah, I really don't know, but I'd be really interested to, I don't even know if you could find out, but that would be, that would be something that would really interest me. Lovely, thank you. Um, and there's another question about, is the level of genetic diversity between colonies enough to warrant subspecies classification? Um, I don't think, I don't think that we're kind of classifying them as subspecies. Um, I think we're just saying that the, you know, that they're just kind of, the genetic diversity that we see is obviously quite um, isolated between populations. Um, I know that they have been um, named in the past. Um, they've kind of been given an additional Latin uh, name uh, between the English and Scottish populations. But um, yeah, I, I don't. I don't know really. I mean, they are the they. You know, they have obviously kind of different um, genetic structure, but they are. In terms of um, morphology as well, the the um, the Scottish populations are um, larger than the Lake District populations as well. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't I don't know about that really. But thank you. Um, and I can see that Pete Eels has uh, put a link to the Irish Mountain Ringlet arc, uh, article um, in the question and answer. So if anyone wants to to into that they can they can follow that link um there's a question from thomas webb is saying thank you for your talk um is the domain areas you can look at for the butterflies restricted by the resolution of the climate model <clears throat> yeah that's a good question um so we we did quite a large um you know um about a 50k resolution for our model and the the reason for this is because we we were interested in looking over millennia, you know, from the, over time, last glacial to look at um, general population dynamics, which was appropriate for the questions we were asking um, and also for the data available. Um, but for kind of future questions, especially to do with um, deciding if and um, where you might do translocations, for example, um, you know, this would be appropriate for a, a finer scale uh, species distribution modeling uh, within a certain country, um, which also kind of is incorporated with um, habitat uh, cover um, and, you know, genetics, if that data is available as well. So, um, yeah, so the resolution we picked was for the kind of millennia questions we were asking. Um, but future work would be appropriate to have um, finer scale country specific models. Thank you. Do you have any follow up on that, Thomas? Uh, no, no, I don't. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, that answers my question perfectly. Thank you Fabulous. for the fantastic talk. Thank you. Uh, right. Uh, I've got another question asking, are there any signs of natural vagrancy from isolated uh, populations to new mountain ranges? No, <laughs> um, not, not that we, well, I say we, not that I am aware of it happening. Um, I think, I think into, you know, because of its distribution um, and a lot of the popula populations are you know, in areas which not many people, you know, just kind of go to on a day to day basis. Um, there isn't as much recording for this species as there are for, you know, a lot of other um, butterflies in the UK, um, you know, with the recording schemes. Um, and so there's there isn't um, 
any kind of long term um, you know, data to, to see whether populations are kind of moving uh, between mountains. Um, but obviously there was this study done, <clears throat> um, you know, a couple of decades ago, uh, looking uh, using old um, distribution data um, and seeing whether, uh, you know, they have been lost. Um, so it's more that they're, they're kind of being lost and retracting, um, but it's unclear if there's any evidence of them colonizing new habitats. So um, I think there'd need to be a bit more recording put in place um, in different populations, which is difficult because like I say, some of these populations are, um, you know, 700 meters <laughs> and uh, doing that climb on a hot day is difficult. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. Um, there's a question from Grain Hawker um, asking, uh, will the species be able to move to north facing slopes? Um, and he also asked um, whether there'll be a recording of the talks he missed the beginning. Um, there'll be an email coming out uh, after, uh, after the talk uh, that will give you a link to where you'll be able to find it once it goes up. It's on our YouTube channel. So uh, you've got an email with that information. Sorry, go on. Sorry, could you repeat what the question yeah. is? Will the, species, um, will the species be able to move to north facing slopes? Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, I'm, uh, it's really unclear about uh, the dispersal capabilities of this species. Um, so I mentioned earlier about a translocation of the mountain ringlet that happened in the Czech Republic. Um, and the paper about this is referenced in um, in my paper if you're interested in, in looking at that. Um, and so obviously this was a sex successful translocation in the area, um, but they found that there was some extra vacant habitat, um, not too far, but in between was kind of a forested, slightly forested landscape. And they, they just not, they hadn't dispersed into this new habitat, even though it was very close. So, and, th and that's kind of the only thing that you can see in the literature, which is anything to do with dispersal of this species. So it's very unclear whether, whether it would be able to move. Um, like I said, especially with the English populations, they seem to be quite isolated. So I'm not sure whether they, whether they even move um, between, you know, kind of two mountains uh, close together. Um, obviously the gene new genetic data will be able to tell me that. Um, so yeah, so it, it's unclear whether they'd be able to do it naturally or not, but if they did, then this would obviously be um, a good adaptation because the northern slopes will be obviously a lot cooler um, than the habitats that they may be at now. Lovely, and Graham also asks, um, are humidity levels important to the species? Um, Presumably, yes, for the uh, kind of plant diversity in the habitat, I assume. Um, obviously, they, they need a uh, mat grass, which is their food plant, um, which is obviously, you know, kind of uh, quite a common site across our upland uh, systems. Um, but also, they obviously need um, nectar as well. So um, mountain upland plants uh, is very important as well. Um, so, yeah, presumably um, important for that, but it must be important for other elements of the life cycle as well. Do you have any follow up, Graham? Uh, no, the only reason I ask about humidity is some of our fritillaries in the southeast of England can only live in coppice woodlands, where presumably the shelter increases the humidity, and yet the same species in the northwest of Britain uh, live out on open hillsides. Um, and I was wondering if the humidity that you get in a coppice woodland is replicated on the hillside just by being in, in the grim west. <laughs> yeah, I mean, actually, yeah, that's that's a very good point in that they, especially when you look at the distribution in Scotland, they are um, much more um, distributed on the west. And, um, you know, the only pop populations uh, are in the east, I think there's Kind of one isolated population in the Cairngorms or or just two and um, they're very very sparse though 
Um, so yeah, yeah, it, it must be obviously important. Yeah. Thank you. Lovely. Um, if anyone's got any more questions that they want to type up, either add them to the question and answer or to the chat, uh, and I can ask them. Um, well, that's the same paper that's been put there again. Um, I was just wondering, could you tell us a little bit more about um, the research that you're looking to do to follow on from where you've got to now? I know you mentioned it briefly at the end of your talk. Yeah, um, so <clears throat> so uh, obviously my field work um, was to answer this these questions that I presented today is you know a kind of European range um, questions, but that we also want to look very much more into the UK in detail. So um, like I said, I, I spent two wonderful field seasons uh, going around the mountain ringlet range, which was absolutely fabulous. Uh, so I went to 19 different populations um, because we want to, like I say, look at um, in, in detail these populations in the UK. So um, doing a lot of different work. So one of, one of the things I'm doing is looking at the morphology, um, in particular the body size and how this relates to um, climate variables, because um, it appears um, in the species that there are more uh, large individuals found uh, where the habitat is cooler and smaller individuals where the habitat is warmer. So kind of at the lowest elevation um, appears to have kind of smaller individuals. Um, and then with the same data, we're also um, gonna be doing DD-RAD sequencing, um, which is a very, very complicated procedure in a lab, but um, you know it gives you fantastic data. So um, you have to get a good amount of DNA um, and then you do various, various bits in the lab um, and then you can sequence this. And what it is, is lots and lots of chunks um, across the genome. So you're not, it's not quite the whole genome, but it's like little bits of it. And it can give you really, really interesting information um, about, well, just the genetic diversity in general, but also how related populations are. So um, I want to look into, like I said, how connected the populations are in England and Scotland, whether, whether there is any gene flow between these populations or whether they are just isolated to the particular mountain that they're on. Um, I'm also uh, wanting to look and see if there's any kind of levels of inbreeding um, within these populations as well. Um, and also looking at how the genetics relates to climate variables um, to see if we can see any signals of um, genetic adaptation um, to temperature, for example, because mm -hmm. as I said before, the mountain ringlet occurs um, on a huge um, elevational scale from, um, you know, about two, 300 uh, in England to about 900 in Scotland. So that's a, a massive range of temperatures and precipitation, things like that. Um, and so, yeah, we wanted to see if some populations, for example, in, in England, may be more adapted to warmer temperatures. Um, and that will give us an idea of how this species may um, may respond to future mm. climate change. Uh, I've just realised that uh, the, the marbled white paper has been sent to everybody now, the oh. link, so it was just sent to the panellists before, sorry about that. So if anyone wants to uh, to read about that, they can. Um, and there's an, another question so ask, from Graham asking, um, are the wings larger in more northerly populations to capture more heat or because long, uh, longer distribution flights are less detrimental? Yeah, it's unclear. Um, so that it's, it's something in the literature which is talked about a lot and it's called um, Bergman's Rule, um, which describes species at um, northern latitudes and higher elevations being larger and more southern and lower elevations being uh, smaller. And there are a number that, they're not really 100% sure of what the main reason uh, this is. It could be to do with um, feeding, uh, season, season length um, and how long they are feeding as a larvae. It could be to do with um, metabolic rate. 
Um, and then obviously, um, like you say, with uh, kind of more surface area for um, gaining heat before they fly. Um, um, and we'll have um, different uh, issues as well. So for example, like you say, with dispersal, the larger populations may be able to disperse further. Um, and small populations sometimes, small individuals sometimes in other insects have been found to uh, have reduced egg laying. Um, so it could be that, you know, this is a not um, the greatest uh, thing for maybe to be small, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, a bit of a ramble. I hope that answered your question. Do you have any, anything else you want to ask, Graham? No, no, I think that covers it. It's just, in, I know in swallowtails in Norfolk, the, they, they were interested in the size of the wings, because obviously if you flew away from the very narrow habitat that was available, you were lost to the population. Whereas in the habitat bigger in Scotland than say in the Lake District, flying around might be advantageous to the species in the long term, because you might find some good habitat. Or it might be just be you've got a bigger wing, wing area to get more heat because it's a bit grimmer in Scotland than the Lake District. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a final question. Um, how do you measure butterfly morphology? Um, so what we did is because obviously um, my whole PhD is based on the data that I collect. Um, so we actually we actually collected mountain ringlets, um, but we planned this very carefully to make sure that we did not um, impact the population. So we made sure that we only collected less than one percent of the total population there to make sure that we didn't make a, a, an impact. We also only collected males um, at the end of the flight season, um, which will have already mated um, and will have. Um, passed on very soon after that. Um, so we made sure that we weren't making a dent. Um, but what we did is we we collected them from the 19 populations over the two years. And and we, you know, we kind of are using every part of them, you know, to get as much research out of this that, you know, that, that, that we collected so that they don't need to be collected again, if that makes sense. Um, so obviously we use them for two different DNA sequencing. Uh, which you need a quite a large amount of DNA for. Um, and then we obviously, obviously did the morphology as well. Uh, so what we did is <clears throat> we scanned in the wings um, using just a normal scanner. And then you can measure them uh, using a bit, bit of software um, and you can kind of measure the pixels and then you can translate the pixels into um, an actual measurement. Um, and so that's how I did that. Um, and then I also actually measured um, populations from the Natural History Museum as well, because they have this fantastic um, online data, database um, of their collections. And so you can, you can see, you can download a picture of nearly, well, I think all the mountain ringlets that they have, which is a huge amount. So um, I also scanned uh, those wings as well. Super, thank you. Uh, and you must have been really pleased uh, that your research was the paper was taken up um, by the Guardian. That was uh, it must be quite exciting. Yeah, I was very surprised. Yeah, no, it was. It was um, yeah, it was very very exciting. Yeah, yeah, it was really nice to see. Oh. Um, lovely. Thank you very much. That was really interesting, and I hope um, everyone enjoyed and got all their questions answered. So thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us today. Um, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Just to let everybody know that we have another Ask the Author next month, um, looking at the causes of uh, and lived experience of food insecurity. Um, so that's another one for the, the diary. But, uh, but thank you very much. It's really interesting. Thank you, everyone.